Entrepreneur on Fire, episode 95. Welcome to EntrepreneurOnFire.com, where remarkable entrepreneurs share their inspiring story. Let their journey illuminate your path to success. And now, your host, John Dumas. Fire Nation, do you have a product or service that you would like to share with the 100,000 plus unique downloads Entrepreneur on Fire generates every month consisting of passionate entrepreneurs? Chris Brogan sponsored an episode for his book, The Impact Equation, with great results. If you would like to have 15 seconds at the top of Entrepreneur on Fire to share your product or message, go to SponsorEOFire.com to find out more. Okay, let's get started. I am simply thrilled to introduce my guest today, Tim Ferriss. Tim, are you prepared to ignite? Always. Yes. <laughs> All right, Tim. Tim has been listed as one of Fast Company's most innovative business people of 2007, Forbes Magazine's Names You Need to Know in 2011, and is the seventh most powerful personality on Newsweek's Digital 100 Power Index for 2012. He's an angel investor, advisor, and author of the number one New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Business Week bestseller, The 4-Hour Workweek, which has been sold in over 35 languages. His latest release, The 4-Hour Chef, is an instant classic. I've given Fire Nation a little overview, Tim, but take a minute, tell us about you personally, we want to get to know you, and then take another minute and tell us about what you're up to right now. Sure thing. Well, I, I suppose I have made a, an accidental career of taking my quirks and peculiar hardwiring, uh, i.e. being a, a human guinea pig, and turned it in uh, to something that's actually sustainable. So I, I never planned on it. And uh, the connecting the dots in hindsight is maybe easy, but uh, certainly going from uh, graduating with a degree in East Asian studies to working for a startup in mass data storage, then sports nutrition, then traveling around the world effectively unemployed and, and then ending up an author was, uh, was, was not entirely planned. But uh, I think that's, that's part of uh, the, the benefit of being an entrepreneur is that you can seize opportunity when you see it. Uh, the, uh, the question of what I'm up to now uh, would be focused primarily on the four-hour chef. I'm, uh, I, I'm really excited about this latest book, and it's certainly the most beautiful thing that I've ever had the opportunity to put together with a thousand plus full color photographs and hundreds of illustrations and whatnot. Uh, so that's pretty much focused on that, and then I'll be uh, I'll be taking a little mini retirement after this. And you'll definitely have deserved it, Tim. I'm holding on to the book right now, and it is just a mammoth masterpiece of beauty. I mean, color images throughout and just as crafted in such a way. It's something you just want to keep hanging on to. And I never thought I'd go back to a, to a hardcover book after I fell in love with my Kindle Fire. But this is something that I will be curling up to uh, on my couch pretty often and truly enjoying it like you just can't from any other way. Yeah, this, uh, this you know, you bring up a good point. There are so many of my readers, uh, because my, my readers are really uh, early adopters and, and technologists or avid tech users anyway. But there are so many tweets and Facebook messages saying, I never thought I'd say this, but you, you really have to get the 4-Hour Chef in print. And the reason is, a lot of people don't know this about me, uh, I wanted to be a comic book penciler uh, for about 10 years. I was actually a, a, an illustrator for two years in college. It's part of how I paid my expenses. Wow. And this book was an opportunity for me to design, work on, a, along with a lot of very good designers, designing a book spread by spread, which is something you just don't get in digital. So the, the two-page spread by two-page spread by two-page spread and having that storytelling and experience is something that uh, at this point is pretty hard to replicate in digital, uh, along with just the, the tactile experience of using a particular stock or a particular embossing and things like that. But it, uh, it was a very fun project for me and really got me excited about some of the more, or I should say less uh, tangible passions that I've had in the past, like art. Uh, so I'll be spending a lot of 2013 rediscovering those. Wonderful. Well, I'm totally stoked to delve more into this later in the interview. But before we do, we want to start off this show like we do every Entrepreneur on Fire interview. And that's with a success quote or your mantra, Tim. So what do you have to share with us, Fire Nation, today? 
I, the the quote that comes to mind, I, I was thinking about this, is actually a Bill Cosby quote. And uh, Bill Cosby is an amazing guy for, for a whole host of reasons. If you haven't seen the documentary The Comedian about Jerry Seinfeld, I would encourage everyone to see it. It tracks Jerry Seinfeld and then a new up-and-coming comedian as they both develop new material. And it's it's such an amazing contrast of professional and unrefined amateur. It's, it's, it's incredible. But Seinfeld holds Bill Cosby on this pedestal as the consummate uh, professional. And Bill Cosby's quote was, uh, and this is not in the, in the documentary, but I read it in another location. It was, there's no one sure path to success, but there is one sure path to failure, and that's trying to please everybody. Uh, and that, that has stuck with me, and it's a, a quote and a philosophy that I revisit very regularly because I do think, particularly in a digital age where you can become a, a prisoner of your own instant accessibility, whether it's through Twitter, through Facebook, through email, through phone calls, voicemail, text messages, etc., you can end up becoming purely reactive just because you want people to like you. And I'm not immune to that. I want people to like me as well. But it can have a hugely harmful effect on your life where you end up running your life on an agenda that is purely created by other people. And I, I think that when that happens, you can't really manifest the greatest value that you have to offer the world. And that's a, that's a, that's a huge, uh, I think, sort of uh, spit in the face of humanity. <laughs> so the, the Bill Cosby quote is something I, I come back to very regularly. And it's something I came back to as part of my New Year's resolutions for 2013. I can just see how that can be such a great mantra for you in your life, Tim. So again, this is about your journey personally as an entrepreneur. So take us down to the ground level. How have you recently or at some point in your past actually applied that quote, that mantra to your everyday life? There, there have been a lot of ways that I've, I've, implemented, uh, I've implemented that. And it's, it's closely related to another uh, this core tenet of my personal operating system, which is to make the big good things happen, you have to get comfortable letting the small bad things happen, right? So if you have this one to-do list item that's been lingering for days or weeks or months that you know you have to take care of, <clears throat> maybe you should not run off to ship the Netflix back, pay the penalty, you know, pay the extra $5. Maybe you should let yourself get that parking ticket or whatever it might be that you need to stop using as a means of procrastination. Uh, there, there are always small bad things that can and will happen. And I feel like uh, the most effective people I know are very good at letting the small things go uh, and recognizing that they're either very small and inconsequential or at the very worst reversible, right? And I'm not recommending people send in their taxes late or anything like that, but Maybe sending in your AAA payment, you know, two weeks later and paying a five dollar uh, <laughs> premium is worth getting that, that one major to do that will change everything to the next milestone. And I've applied that not only how I view my my to do list. So I'll, I'll scan my to do list each day or each week and ask myself which single item is the force multiplier that would change everything else. Usually it's what would make you most uncomfortable as a conversation or email or otherwise. Uh, but secondly, I, I've applied that to my, my companies in the past. Uh, so for instance, when uh, I have been managing contract manufacturers and fulfillment centers and so on and so forth, uh, I have increased the independent decision-making thresholds. What I mean by that is, I recall at one point in 2004, I was getting, I was doing probably 60 hours a week of customer service related email work. Because I would get uh, an inquiry from, say, the call center manager, or not call center, fulfillment center manager in the middle of the US, uh, this is in Lebanon, Tennessee, uh, for a bunch of shipping reasons. And they would say, well, we have an Olympian who wants product overnighted to such and such a country. How should we build this? Are we allowed to do this? And we were, I was handling all these in a very one-off fashion, even though we had certain rules for what they could and couldn't do. And 
I sent an email to everyone at one point, all of the managers I dealt with at, at these different contracted companies, these third parties, and I said, I am, no, I am no longer your customer. My customers are your customer. If something can be fixed for $100 or less, please just fix it and log it in an Excel spreadsheet, and I'll review these decisions at the end of each week. And I did that, and it started off $100 or less on a weekly basis, and then over time, as I realized nothing happened, nothing really bad happened, and my customer service uh, time dropped down to less than two hours a week, 60 to two, very dramatic. I mean, this is within a one or two week period. I ended up increasing it to you know, $250 every, uh, you know, $250 in checking every two weeks, then $500 threshold checking every month. And did little things happen? Yeah, things went wrong. Did they make some bad decisions? Yes, they did. Were they all very minor or reversible? And did, did they allow me to then get the distribution from two or three countries to 12 countries or increase the product uh, profitability you know, 10, 20% in the same period of time? Yes, it did. So it, it had a huge life-changing impact for me personally, also financially in the business. Uh, and I think they all are related to that Bill Cosby quote. No, and that's just great insight. And to jump back to your first point that you made, as entrepreneurs, we all have things that we know that we have to do on a daily basis, things that we do need to prioritize. And for me, my day really changed for the positive when I listened to one of my mentors, Brian Tracy, who said, swallow the frog first. And when I really started adapting that mentality and just doing the thing that I knew I had to get done, but I normally would have procrastinated on and getting that done first, it just set the tone for the day. So... I love those two points that you made, and that was just another thing that's really been very powerful for me as an entrepreneur. And I would just like to use that to transition, Tim, into our next topic, which is failure. Because as entrepreneurs, we face failure every single day, and the ones that thrive are the ones that embrace failure. And you're our spotlighted entrepreneur today, so I want to talk about a time when you failed in your past, or when you just came up against an obstacle that was extremely challenging to overcome, and then Share with us how you did overcome that obstacle, that challenge, or that failure. Yeah, well, I could, I could talk about a very recent example. That'd be great. Yeah, let's talk about The 4-Hour Chef, right? I mean, The 4-Hour the Chef was a huge experiment, and uh, it continues to be an experiment. Uh, you know, like you noted, I mean, I'm on the, on the front page of Amazon oftentimes for a lot of people when they, when they jump onto the homepage. Uh, but as the first major book out of Amazon Publishing – there was quite a brouhaha about this book and my move from Random House. And uh, with all of the muscle, or I should say, despite all of the muscle that Amazon has brought to the table, there have been some really serious handicaps uh, related to the book launch and uh, as it relates to the New York Times bestseller list and whatnot. So the, uh, my target, as it ha has always been, is, is number one, New York Times, among other lists. And uh, because the book was boycotted by all of Barnes & Noble, as well as almost all of the major retailers, Books A Million, et cetera, nationwide, uh, I ended up at number four on the New York Times bestseller list. Now, I suppose that's appropriate <laughs> with my, the way I use four. All the, <laughs> uh, and it, it ended up on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, the, the USA Today bestseller list, and so forth and so on. But on the New York Times list, the there's a combined uh, print and digital bestseller list, uh, or I'm sorry, on the Wall Street Journal list there is, and there's also an ebook bestseller list on the New York Times. But the New York Times does not count advice how to miscellaneous books, books in that particular category, that particular bestseller list. And I sold uh, more than oh, I'd say more than half of the books I sold that first week were digital on Kindle, and not a single one counted for the New York Times. So I ended up number four New York Times. And to me, that was a huge crushing blow in a way. And uh, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it was really painful to work so hard on something for a, a year and a half. I mean, I really do think this is my best book in a lot of ways. And I had a lot of my, my uh, sort of self-worth and the ego and everything else invested in this baby that I'd spent so much time just – uh, protecting from all the elements and fighting for. And I mean, my God, if you could look underneath the, the hood on that book and what went into it, like it was a just a, a war of attrition on so many fronts to get that thing done the way I wanted it to be done to make it optimal for my readers and just a beautiful experience. And then at, 
at uh, at the at the judgment day to have it fall at number four and not number one was really painful for me, and um, the uh, which sort of highlighted for me how capricious uh, and subjective the New York Times can be. And that's not sour grapes. Just pointing out that like you have to choose your metrics very carefully. And uh, this is this is the lesson I took out of it. It's like all right, well. I know, Amazon knows, a lot of people realize that none of my my digital counted for the New York Times. And whether or not the New York Times uh, places it at number one, the the book has, has really pushed forward the conversation about what is possible and what the future holds. And I mean, you can see right now, Barnes & Noble boycotted me, great. What's your, you know, I said this in interviews, I said, you know, what's their 20-year plan? And now in the news every week is there, uh, the, the, the next financial trouble that they're having. And I, I think that by taking a few hour, arrows as the, the person at the forefront, which you do always if you're trying to pioneer something, uh, I, you know, I've brought the conversation forward. And the metrics that I'm paying attention to now, uh, now more so than the New York Times, are number one, how are the three books doing together because I view them as a trilogy and uh, is everything trending in the right direction, right? So books come out, there are a lot of one-week wonders, but I, I am in it for the long haul. And the book is pretty much where it was on Amazon you know, uh, a week after release or three weeks before release. And so it's sticking very well, which to me is most important because it indicates that people are buying, are continuing to buy it because of word of mouth, not just marketing. Um, but that, that was, uh, that was, a, that's a very recent example of an extremely painful experience for me. And I, th- I think it's important for people to realize, you know, whether you're just getting started or whether you've had your first few major wins or you're at the top of your game. And I don't think I'm yet at my top, the top of my game, hopefully, but, uh, you don't ever get rid of the problems. You just trade up in problems, right? It's like taking, you used to have, the Toyota Corolla of problems, and now you trade it in, you have like Mercedes S class of problems. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not particularly religious, but I think that you know the universe sort of chooses battles and foes for you that are commensurate with your capabilities. So uh, I, th- I think it's good to be prepared for that and to view that as part of the journey. Well, Tim, you're being very gracious, and let me just give you my perspective as an outsider here, and and it's that you are really exposing the underbelly of the system and showing the system to be broken as it is. And so on behalf of entrepreneurs, I just want to thank you for taking that leap into this void and really just making this system exposed. And there's going to have to be fixes to this in the future because obviously digital books, things along these lines, this is the wave of the future. And these archaic systems need to shape up or ship out. And so I just really am glad that you were the one that took that leap. It was a brave maneuver. And you're really just leading the way and holding the torch for the rest of us entrepreneurs who are going to be following you into this void that is soon obviously going to be extremely populated place. So thank you. Oh, I, that's very kind of you to say. And I, I appreciate it. And I, I do think there are going to be people who are going to, with new technologies, whether it's using Atavist or otherwise, uh, whether it's uh, you know, iTunes, you know, via iBooks, or Amazon itself, people are going to do this in a much smoother, much more coordinated fashion. And I think that um, by accelerating a lot of these changes, you know, by partnering with BitTorrent, by highlighting some of the problems with the New York Times list, these the changes that are going to take place in the next few years are going to very, I think, are going to very heavily favor content creators, which is great. I mean, it's really exciting for me to see a shift uh, in the power dynamic from people who have a stronghold on physical distribution to the people who are creating good content and who have a direct relationship with their readers, listeners, customers, whatever it might be. Couldn't agree with you more, Tim. I just returned from New Media Expo by Blog World in Las Vegas, where I was fortunate enough to speak on that subject specifically, the content creation within podcasting, having a daily podcast myself. And it's just incredible to see even these last six months when I attended the the New Media Expo slash Blog World in Manhattan back in June, as opposed to now, just the amount of people that have since come to this convention as opposed to the other one, and then the podcasting track specifically, just the numbers of people that are packing into each speech and each talk was just really powerful to, to see. And the buzz in general 
about content was just really exciting. So let's use that to transition to our next topic, which is that aha moment. And you've shared with us already in this interview a number of aha moments that you've had. And I just would like to step back again to sometime in your journey, because this is about you, Tim. Have you had a powerful light bulb that went off at some point that you just really said, wow, the clouds parted, the sun just shined through, and you said, this is going to resonate. I need to move forward with this. And if so, then share with us how you turned that moment into success. Oof, I've had a lot of aha moments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lucky man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, a lot of those are born out of, out of crises, so... <laughs> The best yeah. often are, let's be honest. You oftentimes don't get one without the other. But I would say that the the aha moment that I have on a fairly regular basis, uh, just something that is very worth revisiting, also sparked initially probably in the 2004, 2005 time range. And uh, even recently in the last year or so for me uh, has been a quote by – uh, Oprah Winfrey, in fact. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, Love yeah. it. And the quote is, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's something along the lines of, you know, I used to feel like I had to have a high level of stress. And if I didn't have a high level of stress, I wasn't doing a good job. I no longer feel that way. And uh, the my, my girlfriend actually I think put it very well where she, one of the words that she wants to focus on for 2013 or I suppose a state is uh, that of ease and I don't think that ease means uh, being lackadaisical or uh, lazy it means picking your shots and focusing on your strengths like you don't in there are many cases I think where entrepreneurs assume that they have to do a laundry list of things that they hate doing. And I've just found, yes, there are always things that you prefer not to do, right? I mean, I have have a stack of papers from my accountants that I need to go through before I leave the country. Do I want to do that? No, I don't. I have to. And that's fine. But there are many, many examples of of activities you just don't have to participate in if you choose not to, right? So it's like, for instance, I, I find that many entrepreneurs get wrapped up in the latest tool du jour, they're like, oh my God, like, I don't understand Pinterest. I need to figure out Pinterest. Oh my God, I don't understand Tumblr. I need to get a Tumblr account, figure out Tumblr. It's like, no, you need to understand the basic principles that underlie communicating effectively. And then you need to pick one tool that you are confident is, is going to be around for some time. And I think the best indication of that is usually that it's been around for some time, like for instance, WordPress, uh, and focus on making that your strength and really choose one tool and get good at using it. You don't have to be reactive and and develop this list of uh, stress inducing activities. Um, So I think that the uh, focusing on, on ease and less is more and really asking the hypothetical questions that help you to get there are very important. So I'll, I'll run through questions. These appeared in the four hour work week because I use them, but I'll ask, you know, if I could only spend, one hour this week working, what would I spend that 60 minutes on, right? I mean, hypothetically, I'm not saying that's what I'm going to do, but if I had to spend 60 minutes on, let's just say, revenue generating activities this week, what would I spend those 60 minutes on? And as soon as you you use that filter, it's like, all right, guess what? Like, that's what you're spending your first 60 minutes on tomorrow morning, <laughs> right? And uh, I, I, I just find that the aha moment is something that I have to revisit. And I want to underscore that point because becoming a good entrepreneur, becoming a good good deal maker, becoming a good marketer, it's not a one-time thing, right? It's it's not like, uh, it's very similar to athletic training. It's like, okay, you want to be strong? You want to have low body fat? You want to be fast? You have to have a training regimen. And I think that is true for entrepreneurship as much as it is for athletics. If you want to be effective, you have to have rituals in place and you have to revisit certain principles again and again and again to keep the, to keep the, the blade sharp. So, Tim, have you had an I've made it moment? Uh, yeah, I suppose the uh, wins. I've had wins of different types. I mean, the, I'll tell you, I've never felt richer than the first time I had a successful entrepreneurial experience in college, which was uh, after making ends meet as 
I was doing a couple of different jobs. I was working as an illustrator, which was very kind of, I wouldn't say feast or famine. It was more like, uh, you know, ramen or famine. <laughs> uh, then I worked at, as a librarian in the, the guest library, which was an East Asian studies library uh, at my university for $8 an hour. And then I bounced uh, on the weekends um, as, as an additional way to make ends meet. So the, I, the, at the very most, I think I was making $20 an hour, which to me was a, a huge sum of money. And I remember my first real entrepreneurial success uh, was <laughs> holding an accelerated learning three-hour seminar. Uh, this, is at, this is at Princeton University, but it was a three-hour seminar focused on predominantly speed reading and something that I had taught myself to be very good at to handle this ridiculous volume of reading that was expected of you, coursework. And I couldn't afford to rent a space, so I, I ended up using the daycare center of a church off hours <laughs> for my three hours uh, my three-hour seminar, nice. and, and uh, it was fifty dollars a person, and we ended up selling it out. Or I should say, we—that's the royal we. It's just a ha old habits die hard as an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Uh, it was, I ended up selling it out. Thirty-two people or so uh, over three hours. So I went from making twenty dollars an hour to you know twelve hundred dollars or whatever it was. And I remember finishing this seminar, and people were very happy with it. But <laughs> getting on my bike to ride back to the dorm <laughs> room and I just had, you know, crumpled twenty dollar bills and checks like spilling out of my pockets. I had I didn't have anywhere to put it. I don't know I don't know what I expected exactly, but you know, I had like wads of checks and twenty dollars in my hands on the handlebars because I didn't have enough room in my pockets. <laughs> and I just remember riding that bike and feeling like I was on nine, just on top of the world, king of the world, <laughs> you know, Rocky up on top of the steps. Like I, I think that was a huge light bulb moment for me because I realized like all of these books I've been reading, all of these success stories, because I, I loved reading entrepreneurial books and yes. the, Tracy and the Zig Ziglar. Like I got, I read everything I could get my hands on. I, I remember, uh, I don't think I've ever said this before, went to Firestone Library to try to, I, I really didn't have a lot of money, and I went to you know, Firestone Library at Princeton, which is an amazing library, to try to find Think and Grow Rich, and Think and Grow Rich wasn't there. They didn't have Think and Grow Rich, but they had a book, which was a variation of it, uh, authorized, called Think and Grow Rich. I think it was like Think and Grow Rich, a black choice. It was written for African Americans, and I will tell you, I think it's actually better than the original in a lot of ways. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It gets into some psychological stuff that just isn't covered. And I read everything I get my hands on, but I didn't really believe it was possible. I mean, I, I, I did, but I didn't because I tried a bunch of things and nothing had worked. And then this seminar finally worked. And riding home, I was like, my God, you know, my life will never be the same after this point. I, I just went from $20 an hour to or whatever it was. And uh, Seeing that it didn't progress did not have to be incremental just blew my mind. It, it really, it really opened me up to bigger dreams at that point. So I'd say that was probably, certainly, since we're talking about entrepreneurship, the biggest uh, I've made it moment <laughs> on top of the summit that uh, that comes to mind. I mean, I've never felt richer than in that moment. No, that's great, Tim. And I truly love when my guests say. I don't think I've ever shared this before. And then they go on to say it because that's one thing about the format I found of Entrepreneur on Fire is that it really, we just continue to go back into the journey and back into the journey and just keep bringing up these great ideals and memories. And then nine times out of 10, as we're speaking, like yourself, the interviewees, they just think of something they haven't thought of in so long and they share it and it's just really powerful. And that specifically was really powerful. And I'd love to just track now after this interview goes live, what the spike rate is with Amazon as far as Think and Grow Rich, the black edition. I mean, I think that I want to read that book now. I mean, it sounds incredible, but I don't think I ever would have heard of it. So that's really interesting. And that's exactly one reason why I always ask this question. Have you had an I've made a moment? Because every entrepreneur looks at this question differently. Some people will say, I've never had an I've made a moment. I never will. That will denote the end of the journey. But if there's one thing that Facebook's done right in my mind, is they're used to the word milestones. Because I'm a huge believer in actually reaching milestones in the journey and really appreciating them. And it's just great that you can look back at that as a milestone in your life. And it is an extremely powerful one. 
and build off of that. So let's use that to lead into our last topic before the lightning round, which is just the current time, the present things that you have going on in your life that you're really excited about. Pull out one thing that you just like to chat about to Fire Nation, to our audience right now, and just let it go. Oh, boy. Uh, two things. Uh, can I do two or should I do one? Absolutely, Tim. You can do two. All right. <laughs> the first, it, and I have, I have a sign over my doorway. You may have seen this in the 4-Hour Chef, but uh, a sign that says, simplify. And it's a pan-painted sign. That's all it says, which I bought uh, actually at a, a brunch place in Truckee, California, up north. Really small town. Went in to have an omelet, and there was this hand-painted sign on the wall. It was covered with signs, but this one said simplify. And I loved it so much that I asked the server if the owner was there. She wasn't. I ended up calling her and brokered a deal to buy this sign from her <laughs> off the wall because I knew I needed it. Take, take us through just a 10 second. What was that broken? What did it sound like? 50 bucks? No, 120? Like, how'd that go? Wasn't much. Well, I, I, I'll tell you, it went smoother than I would have expected because <laughs> I, I, I basically said, look, I know this is a, an odd, super odd call out of left field. Here's my name. Uh, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I know that I'm hardwired to be a workaholic and to have a life of complexity. So I constantly strive to simplify, and the sign caught my eye. It's exactly what I need. Is there anything that I could offer or do uh, to purchase it from you or trade uh, trade for the sign? And we ended up having a couple of email back and forth, and she's like, are you that four-hour guy? And I was like, yeah, that's me. And she said, that it turned out that the four-hour work week had had a huge impact on her business. So she said, if you can send me a two signed copies of the four-hour work week, I'll send you the sign. Wow. So, what page? I need to see this. What page is it on? Do you have any idea? Uh, it is uh, actually at the very end of the conclusion. You'll see the sign. So the very back of the four-hour chef. And uh, the, the that book, uh, or not that book, but that sign, rather, I think – really underscores something that's also in a book called Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb, uh, which, is, which I recently read. And that is, you shouldn't strive to fix things by addition first. You shouldn't try to fix or improve things by adding things first. You should look at what you can remove first. First step should be problem, what can I remove? Or objective, what can I remove to get there faster? Look at removal before adding. Uh, and then secondly, I would say is this, this rediscovery of drawing. This is, you asked what I was interested in right now. But taking this passion of mine that was really the love of my life for uh, more than, certainly more than a decade that just died when I got into the, the quote, real world. Uh, I let it go because I viewed it as completely unimportant and I was focused on money and focused on learning these business skills. And I, I think that it's extremely easy to lose track of what we're doing all this work for. And yes, being an entrepreneur itself can be creative. Yes, working on products can be creative. But there's more to life than just working on your business or working on yourself solely to work on your business. And uh, for me, to 2013, I want to be a year of rediscovering a lot of these things. Like for the 4-Hour Chef was an incredible process, uh, a, a huge mountain to climb, and it's done. And I want to take some time to focus on things that are completely unrelated to any type of revenue generation. And I think that for just a, a sense of calm and a sense of completeness as a person, it's really important for entrepreneurs not to lose track of that. Tim, those are just some great insights. And for all the listeners out there that were wondering, I found the Simplify. It was on page 564. It's gorgeous in its simplicity. And the quote you have below it is, as long as you live, keep learning how to live. And that's just a powerful quote to go below a very powerful word. So thank you for sharing that, Tim. And we're going to now go into the last segment of our show, which is the lightning round. And this is where I get to ask you a series of questions, Tim, and you just come back at us, Fire Nation, with amazing and mind-blowing answers. Does that sound like a plan? <laughs> I can answer quickly. We'll see if they're, they're mind-blowing. <laughs> what was holding you back from becoming an entrepreneur? Lack of confidence. Lack of confidence that I could make it that I that I could make it happen, and um, 
the easiest. Yeah, that that's it. I'll just put it there. And and I to to just add to that real fast. I don't think that you have confidence and then act. I think that you act, and that's the only way you develop confidence. Just, I think that that's an Im- important point, and I think that's what got me over the got me over the hurdle. Wonderful. And just a quick note, even though this is called the lightning round, I definitely want you to expound as much as you want to. Okay, got it. What is the best business advice you ever received? Best business advice, probably that you are the average of the five people you associate with most. Yes, I love that one. Your peer, you know, seek out peers or mentors or friends very, very carefully. And uh, be very careful about uh, again, focusing on removal instead of just addition. Uh, be very careful about spending time with with sort of toxic, pessimistic, be realistic type influences. What do you regret doing or not doing at some point in your journey, and what lesson did you learn? I don't have many regrets. That might be from just brainwashing myself over many, many years <laughs> to look at things differently and reading a lot of stoicism, like letters from a stoic. But I would say. Uh, perhaps the one regret that I would have is uh, getting so caught up in this last book that I spent way too much time sitting down and developed some back and hip issues as a, a result of that. I'm I'm already reversing them and I'm they're, they're pretty much completely reversed after now you know, about two months of working on them. But uh, I really do. I think that sitting is death, and <laughs> that's actually a quote from a guy named Kelly Starrett, who's an amazing trainer, and. Uh, the the very minimal maintenance for the human body, I think, is extremely important for people who are feel compelled to sit down for long periods of time. Um, so, just t- I should have taken uh, slightly better care of myself while I was really in the the pit of despair when uh, when in the finishing stretch of the four hour chef. And can you just really quickly touch upon a couple things that have been really successful in you reversing that situation? Yeah, super simple. A couple of things I would recommend. Uh, the the first is getting either a small foam roller or a lacrosse ball, and working on uh, it, whether it's adhesions or or simple trigger points in uh, glutes, glute medius on the outside of the hip, uh, the hip flexor itself, so the the, the, the psoas, and doing squats. Honestly, if you want to keep yourself in shape. Ensure that you can perform a few fundamental movements like uh, full range squats uh, with weight, ideally, when you can get to that point. And uh, also deadlift uh, twisting motions, which I do not encourage using weights for off the bat. You can do the, 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 the chop and lift, which is in the four-hour body, is extremely effective. So if I had to choose, let's say, four movements uh, and I do think that you fix most of these problems, not through passive stretching, but actually weight-bearing exercises. I would say the squat, which is number one for uh, undoing a lot of these hip issues in my experience. And even in literally two weeks, you'll find all, a lot of these issues, IT band tightness, hip tightness, lower back pain just vanish if you're doing proper squats. Uh, the two-handed kettlebell swing which you can do with a dumbbell and you can, you can make kettlebells out of something called the T-bar for about $10 at Home Depot. Uh, the chop and lift, which you would need cables for, so you can, or, or tubing, but I prefer cables. And then uh, something called the Turkish getup, which you need proper instruction for, but all four of those are covered in the four hour body. And literally you could do 10 minutes twice a week and prevent all of the issues that I ended up experiencing at the tail end of the four hour chef. So there's really no excuse. Wonderful. Tim, if you could only choose two websites to obtain all the information needed to succeed, what would they be and why? It's like Google and Wikipedia. Those aren't very interesting answers, but... <laughs> Simplicity, Wikipedia, baby. I'd say Google and Wikipedia. Wikipedia is also, if, when I'm doing research on books, if I'm looking at, let's say, potentially 50 books for a given subject and I want to narrow it down to three or four books to read, I will use... Uh, I will use Amazon and focus on, on books that have four star or higher average review. Uh, then I'll look at the most critical, helpful three and four star reviews of those books. Then that, that will typically help you narrow it down from like 50 to probably 10. Uh, I will then buy all 10 on the Kindle and uh, look at their most highlighted passages on the Kindle and their Wikipedia 
summaries to decide then which two or three to really drill into and focus on uh, that I'll enjoy reading and have actionable takeaways from. Wow, specific. Thank you. Do you have an internet resource, Tim, like an Evernote that you're just in love with that you can share with our listeners? Internet resource. Let me take a look. I'm looking at my iPhone right now. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'll also look at my doc here on my Mac to see what pops up. Let's see. I do use Sketch, but that was acquired by Evernote, so that's not, <laughs> not exactly. Take a quick look. I do use this is not really an online resource exclusively. I use Uber almost daily in San Francisco and other cities that I visit uh, to really add predictability to most of my travel. Uh, let me take another look. TaskRabbit, I use yes. very, their Deliver Now feature. I use all the time. So for instance, today, I'm leaving to the UK tomorrow. I have a bunch of stuff I have to get done. Like I mentioned, I have uh, you know, a dentist appointment. <laughs> Uh, some stuff to get to my accountant, et cetera. I don't have time to pick up a few things uh, like creatine monohydrate uh, or specific type of creatine I want to get at GNC. I'm not going to do it myself. So I can have TaskRabbit pick it up for $10 and deliver it to wherever I might be. Uh, I use that very, very consistently. And uh, Lyft is another one that I, that I use quite a lot for behavioral modification. So that, that's the only tool that's gotten me to floss regularly out of everything I've ever tried uh, is the app Lyft, L-I-F-T, not L-Y-F-T, which is a, a, a ride-sharing app. Uh, those would be a few that come to, me, come to mind immediately. Uh, Duolingo is another one that I actually use a lot. I'm an investor in this company. It's, a, it's a, the only language learning company I've invested in. And uh, Duolingo allows me to work on whether it's German or Spanish, whatever language I happen to be working on while I'm waiting in airport security or where, while I'm killing five or 10 minutes or whatever. And it's free. So I, I use that quite a lot as opposed to just checking Twitter or Facebook or something. I'll actually work on uh, resurrecting or a language or learning new languages. Wow. We're going to have some busy listeners. So thank you for that. If you could recommend one book for Fire Nation, Tim, what would it be? I've heard of this amazing book called Four Hour Chef. No. <laughs> that will be featured on the show notes page. Uh, yeah, if you want to learn how to learn uh, and recognize that life is short, that's 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 one of the picks. But uh, oldie but goodie, uh, and I this this is my go to. I, I can see it right in front of me, about five feet away from me. In fact, is uh, Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. It's about two thousand years old, but it, it is the ultimate uh, operating system for entrepreneurs who want to who who want to perform brilliantly in high stress environments. I think that uh, Seneca. Uh, Letters from a Stoic, and uh, it is really a, a must-have book. And also that quote that you read underneath the simplify sign is from Lucius Seneca. Seneca yes, Dio. that is great. So Tim, this is the last question, but it's kind of tricky. So take your time, digest it, and then just come back at us with a nice 30-second answer. Imagine you woke up tomorrow morning in a brand new world, identical to Earth, but you knew nobody. You still have all the experience and knowledge you currently have. Your food and shelter is taken care of, but all you have is a laptop and $500. What would you do in the next seven days? <laughs> it's a tough one. Right? <clears throat> I know what my answer would be. Uh, this is... This is of course, as it would have to be a personal answer, but uh, people might be able to, to pull something from this. Uh, I would create I would create a blog and I would uh, plan on focusing on generating really, really good content, the best content I could generate, maybe let's just say five or six posts. And the same day that I set up the blog, just getting the formatting and everything ready, I would buy a plane ticket to a conference of some type with that $500. I could, I could find a place to crash somewhere, YMCA or couch surfing. Actually, I'd probably use, combine it with couch surfing to stay somewhere for free. Uh, and I would choose a conference like South by Southwest or one of these places where I could connect with uh, tastemakers and thought leaders and influencers related to the content of my blog and meet them in person. So maybe that, let's just say hypothetically from San Francisco, that I'm able to get that flight maybe as a standby flight for $250, maybe uh, $250, $300, it gives me $200, and I'd spend the remaining money on uh, cheap food for me, burritos maybe, something like that, while traveling and uh, buying, buying drinks or coffee for these people at the conferences. 
uh, and specifically the way I would go about finding those people is approaching moderators of panels or organizers of panels, introducing myself briefly, telling them what I'm up to. And I would have to have some goal or project that was interesting related to the blog uh, and, and indicating that I don't know anyone and asking them who they would recommend I talk to. And also, like, here are a few outside interests of mine outside of business. So maybe you know someone I would get along with and could buy a drink or a cup of coffee. Uh, and that's precisely what I did in 2007 uh, at South by Southwest when the four-hour work week had its tipping point. That is, that is precisely what I did. And I, I would imagine it probably cost less than $500 total. So that's what I would do. Tim, you've just given us some great actionable advice, and we are all better for it. Give Fire Nation one parting piece of guidance and then tell us where we can connect with you and then we'll say goodbye. Focus on leveraging your strengths first and fix, fixing your weaknesses second. I mean, there are some kind of potentially fatal weaknesses like not doing your taxes. You have to take care of that stuff. But aside from that, really focus on identifying and leveraging your strengths because that is where that is where you will, you will end up being able to build world-class companies, world-class skills, et cetera. Uh, and, and I would say as a part of that, <clears throat> each day you could watch in the morning uh, a commencement speech by Neil Gaiman, G-A-I-M-A-N. And I believe the title is Make Good Art, but everyone should watch that. It's one of the best commencement speeches I've ever seen in my life. It's probably, it's, it's very short. And uh, people can connect with me at uh, Facebook, facebook.com slash Tim Ferriss, T-I-M-F-E-R-R-I-S-S. Twitter, at T Ferris, T-F-E-R-R-I-S-S. I, I, do, uh, I mostly share things that are how-to related, uh, although I do throw some funny stuff in there. <laughs> it's, it's sort of my short form how-to stuff is all on, on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, uh, the blog fourhourblog.com, F-O-U-R-H-O-U-R-B-L-O-G.com has, I, I would imagine, close to 500 posts now. Um, a lot of them are extremely in-depth, so ranging from completely deconstructing Kickstarter and looking at how the best people raise you know, $100,000 in less than 10 days or otherwise. A lot of them are really in-depth, and you can choose by topic like marketing. That's uh, Those are the best places to connect with me, and uh, I would love to, love to see uh, your listeners and readers there. Tim, thank you for just being so generous with your time, your expertise, and your experience. Fire Nation, we salute you, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Fire Nation, you asked for it, and I created it. My first free ebook, 10 Incredible Insights from 10 Incredible Entrepreneurs, is published. All four pages of it. Simply go to eofire.com and subscribe to my newsletter. You will get immediate access to the top business insights from the likes of Barbara Corcoran, Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk, and seven other incredible guests. Prepare to ignite. Thank you for joining us at entrepreneuronfire.com, your daily dose of inspiration. Prepare to ignite.